Creatine 21 keeps us firmly within DNA. So now we're looking at DNA structure. They want us to identify which row is correct for guanine. Okay, the double ring structure is a purine, joins its complementary base with three hydrogen bonds. So guanine, the clue is in the U, okay, and that makes it a purine. So yes, it is a purine. Purines versus pyrimidines. Pyrimidine is a longer word, so purine is a longer structure. So purines have a double ring. So the number of hydrogen bonds, we have AT and we have GC. AT is two, so GC is three. So ticks all the way across, which brings us to the matching answer of A. For question 21. Question 22. Messelson and Stahl investigated DNA in bacteria. They grew bacteria in a medium with only heavy nitrogen, 15N, until all the bacterial DNA was heavy. So everybody is 15N. So two strands, 15M. These bacteria were moved from a heavy nitrogen medium and cultured in a medium with only light nitrogen, 14N. Okay. So a sample of bacteria was collected from the first generation in the medium containing light nitrogen and the DNA was analyzed. So we're gonna have DNA replication. So our old strands are each going to split. And each old strand is going to act as a template for a new strand. Now we can't do this in only one part, not going to work. The new strands are going to be 14N. The lighter nitrogen. So now we have our first generation. So hybrid DNA contains both heavy and light DNA. Well, that's right, both of the hybrid. Which row shows the percentage of heavy DNA strands and the percentage of hybrid DNA molecules in the first generation produced in the medium containing light nitrogen? So the percentage of heavy DNA strands, but well, we have two heavy strands and two light strands. Okay, obviously, if we scale this up to our bacteria, that ratio is going to stay the same because each bacteria has gone through this exact same replication. So two heavy, two light means we have 50% heavy DNA strands. And our percentage of hybrid DNA molecules, well, both of them are hybrid because we've only done one replication, so we have 100% hybrid DNA molecules. So where do we circle in both lines? There, our answer is C. So we have 50% heavy, 100% hybrid DNA molecules in that first generation. If we took it to another generation in the light medium, then we'd have a very different ratio that we'd be looking at. Question 23. Which is the correct DNA triplet on the original DNA template that codes for the amino acid histidine, his? Now, we don't know all of these, okay? We know that these triplets exist, but we don't have to memorize them. We are given the information here that we can use to work backwards. So we're working with his. So we know now that the anticodon, read your tables carefully, is GUA. Now remember that anticodon belongs to the tRNA. So if we work backwards step by step, if you prefer, you can go tRNA direct to DNA. But for those of you who like to work a little bit more systematically, if the tRNA is GUA, what was the mRNA? The codon will have been CAU because we would have been complementary. So if we now take that back from the mRNA to the DNA, what would our complementary have been? Well, C would have been a G, A would have been to a T in this case, because DNA has thymine and a U to an A. So our DNA, the original triplet, G, T, A. And we find our matching answer. Question 24. 
The photomicrograph shows tissues in a stained transverse section of a plant stem. Students are asked to draw four adjacent xylem vessel elements. Which drawing, all drawn to the same scale, is correct? So now you actually get to mark other people's drawings. So if we look at our drawings, remember that they're all to the same scale. So are our xylem vessel elements going to be the big ones or the small ones? Well, if we look here, our xylem vessel elements, of course, are these ones here at the bottom with this very, very thick cell wall. So we can cross out A because A, this student has drawn the cells that are not even in the vascular bundle. So definitely not A. B, this student didn't know whether they were looking at a plant or an animal. So we can cross out B. So now we are looking between C and D. Now they were asked to draw four adjacent xylem vessel elements. So a group of four clustered together. And if we look at the shape, our xylems are slightly more with straight sides than curvy sides. So between C and D, C is curvy sides, D is more straight sides. And then on top of that, our D makes a better adjacent grouping. So our drawing that we would go for being correct is D. Question 25. What is a function of the hairs or trichomes on xerophytic leaves? So you stop and you think a moment. Xerophytic, we are water conservation. So when we're conserving water, what do the hairs do? And if we think about it, we're talking now about if we look at the underside of the leaf and then we have the little hairs sticking out. So what are they doing? They are reducing that wind flow across the surface of the leaf. So they're actually trapping that moisture air closer to the stomata and that then reduces the gradient and therefore we have less diffusion from the airspace into the external environment. So adding a waterproof layer, no, that's the cuticle. Protecting the stomata, not really. Reducing the surface area, no, not at all. Trapping a layer of moist air, most definitely C. The function of the hairs is to trap that layer of moist air. Question 26. Which features of companion cells are essential to their function? Companion cells. Remember, we have your sieve tube element, we have the companion cell beside, we have lots of plasmodesmata, we have active loading of sucrose into the companion cell, then it goes across into the phloem. The nucleus and everything belongs in the companion cell. They are one functional unit. So, they are connected by plasmodesmata to the sieve tube elements. Absolutely. They have a thinner cell wall than a sieve tube element. Okay, that has nothing to do with their function because it's, it's like irrespective. Thickness of a cell wall, we usually talk about in regards to the xylem vessels. So that one we can get rid of, it's definitely not two. They contain a nucleus and mitochondria. Absolutely, they've got the nucleus for both cells and the mitochondria are crucial in terms of that active loading of the sucrose. So definitely one and three, which is C. And if we look, this one was quite a nice one because A, B and D all include two in, which we've knocked out. So we're absolutely sure that our answer here is C, one and three only. From plant transport to human transport, question 27. The photomicrograph shows a human blood smear and we've got three different cells labeled. Which row identifies the labeled cells? So looking at these three different types of white blood cells, because of course these ones are your red blood cells, 
who is who. So you can see we've got one with a big nucleus, one with a lobed nucleus, and one with a nucleus so big that it almost fills the entire cell. So two is the easiest one. That is that lobe nucleus that belongs to your neutrophils. Then we've got between a big nucleus and a nucleus that fills almost the entire cell. So the one that fills almost the entire cell, that one is our lymphocyte. A very big nucleus is our monocyte. So now we simply go and we look at the answers and we see who matches ours. So one is not a lymphocyte. So two is a neutrophil, so we knocked out to D and we can confirm three is a lymphocyte. So first do your labeling and then go and identify. Then you don't get twisted up and confused with options that are there to confuse you. So whenever you're answering questions for your multiple choice ways, wherever possible, answer the question first, then find the answer. Question 28. The diagram shows the changes in electrical activity in the heart muscle during one cardiac cycle. This is called an electrocardiograph, an ECG. So you can see your sinoatrial nodes stimulating, you can see ventricular systole, and then they ask you, which electrocardiogram shows a rate of 75 beats per minute? Well, if you've got 75 beats per minute, we have got to think about now how long does it take to do one heartbeat and then what is one heartbeat on each of these diagrams. So 75 beats per minute, we have 60 seconds, because these are all time in seconds, divided by 75 minutes. That gives us 0.8 seconds per beat. So how long is each of these heartbeats? Well, this one here, little bump all the way to the beginning of the next little bump. We're talking it about here. So what's our scale? Uh, one, two, three, four, five makes one. So 0.2s. So this one is about 1.3. It's not the right answer. This one from little bump, to little bump, this one's 0.8. Suggests that B is the answer, but let's confirm against the other two. C, coming down to coming down, we're looking about there, which gives us about 0.5. That's too quick. And this last one is even worse, because look at here. This one is much longer than any of these. This is not a regular heartbeat. So this one we can discount immediately. And we have confirmed that B, 0.8 seconds per beat, that's the one we are looking for. Because that's going to correspond to a heart rate of 75 beats per minute. So this question is slightly different from many other questions that they ask on the same topic. But it's a case of when they ask a slightly different question, the information will be there for you to answer the question. Question 29, which effect could be due to a reduced concentration of carbonic anhydrase? Right, so what does carbonic anhydrase do? Thinking back to that equation, it's involved in that Bohr effect and that changing of the release of oxygen in our tissues where we have high concentrations of carbon dioxide. So, carb amino hemoglobin concentrations will decrease. Less oxygen is released from oxyhemoglobin for active tissues. The pH of the blood will be lowered and the rate of dissociation of carbonic acid is increased. Now, carbonic anhydrase is involved in making carbonic acid, so we are not going to increase the rate of carbonic acid. Okay, pH of the blood will be lowered. 
Well, no, because pH of the blood lowering means we're going to increase those hydrogen ions, which we're not doing in this case. So we're between carbamine and hemoglobin and less oxygen being released. And the whole point of carbonic anhydrase is to increase release of oxygen in active tissues. So B is correct. Carbaminohemoglobin concentrations being decreased is irrelevant in this question. Our answer is most definitely B. Less oxygen is released from oxyhemoglobin for active tissues. So question 30, still sticking with human transport, but something slightly different. Which statement correctly compares blood plasma and tissue fluid in a healthy person? Blood plasma contains more protein than tissue fluid. Absolutely, because those proteins can't get out of the plasma, they're too big. Both blood plasma and tissue fluid contain red blood cells? Absolutely not, those red blood cells are only in the plasma. Tissue fluid contains white blood cells, whereas blood plasma does not. That's also incorrect, because blood plasma does have white blood cells. Tissue fluid is formed from blood plasma and is not returned to blood plasma is also wrong, because it does. Over that capillary bed, we lose the plasma out and get the tissue fluid, but then we have return at the end of the capillary bed. So we have confirmed our initial result of blood plasma containing more protein than tissue fluid is true. And it is the only correct statement that they have offered us out of all four. So our answer is most definitely A for question 30. Question 31. The diagram shows three features found in tissues of the gas exchange system. Ciliated epithelium, goblet cells, and cartilage. So when you're looking at these, you've got to remember back to Venn diagrams from IG. Okay, so what they're saying is anything in here only has goblet cells, anything in here only has cartilage. So this here would be goblet and cartilage, for example. Here at P, where they all three overlap, it means that we have ciliated, goblet, and cartilage. So which tubes of the gas exchange system could be represented at position P in the diagram? So which tubes have got ciliated epithelium, goblet cells, and cartilage? So does the bronchus. Yes, the bronchus has all of these. Bronchiole, no, bronchiole doesn't because a bronchiole is missing quite a lot of this. A trachea, a trachea definitely has all of them. And then we look for the matching row and there it is at C. Bronchus, yes, bronchiole, no, trachea, yes. So again, they're just asking you very straightforward which Features are found in each part of the gas exchange system, but they're asking you in a different way. It makes you have to actually analyze what's going on a little bit in your question. So always read the, very, the information that's given in the question very carefully. So now, question 32. The diagram shows a magnified section of a part of the lungs containing specialized tissues. Which row is correct for structures labeled one to six? So now we have to look very nicely at what are we looking at. So if we look carefully, let's start here with this big loopy thing, okay? See how we've got Circles within fried eggs that are turned. And there's another fried egg that's turned. So this here is a capillary. So two is a capillary. Which would make three a red blood 
cell. Okay, so two is the capillary wall, five is the capillary cytoplasm. So you're a little bit playing detective on figuring out what these things are. Now, if we look, okay, so if this is our capillary wall, then this extra thin wall here must be our alveolar wall. So this must be the airspace inside the alveolus. And what is this thing? Well, it's not part of the alveolus. It's not part of the blood, but it's involved there as well. And it's a cell. I mean, this is a nucleus inside a funky shaped cell. This is now going to be a white blood cell. Most likely a lymphocyte because they are the ones who move through and cause all the problems. So which row is correct for structures labeled one to six? Now we know what they are. So we have a contains a high proportion of carbonic anhydrase, HCO3 minus ions and lysosomes. Well, our lysosomes, they're going to belong in the white blood cell. So that should be at six. Hydrogen carbonate ions, remember they are diffusing into the cytoplasm. Sorry, not into the cytoplasm. Hydrogen carbonate ions diffuse out of the cytoplasm of the red blood cell into the plasma. I'm a little bit shocked that nobody has actually screamed and shouted at me because I'm writing nonsense here as well. Five is not the capillary cytoplasm. There is so much thing, no such thing. This is the capillary lumen, okay, which is the plasma. Okay, I see people were just typing too slowly. <laughs> All right, so obviously I need another cup of tea this morning. So capillaries, of course, surrounded by cells, plasma in the middle with red blood cells, as we have identified in a previous question in this lesson. So that's our capillary lumen. And yes, there are high proportion of hydrogen carbonate ions. And if we work back then, seeing as we only have the one option for this, carbonic anhydrase would be high proportion in three. Three is our red blood cell cytoplasm. And yes, we would have a lot of carbonic anhydrase in there because that's where carbonic anhydrase is doing its job. So our answer is C. So recapping our diagram, our squidgy circle is a capillary with a capillary wall and a capillary lumen filled with plasma. Inside the plasma of our capillary is a red blood cell, which has its own cytoplasm. Next to the capillary, we have our alveolus with its wall and the airspace inside the alveolus. And we have a white blood cell. So the only place we're really going to find a high proportion of lysosomes is in that white blood cell. We're going to have the hydrogen carbonate ions in the plasma in the lumen of the capillary. And we're going to have that carbonic anhydrase in the cytoplasm of the red blood cell. Give you a moment. Is everything else correct in this question? Okay, hopefully all is good. Moving on to question 33. A short-term effect of smoking is a decreased blood supply to the fingers and toes. Which component of cigarette smoke causes this effect? So decreased sub blood supply is narrowing of our blood vessels. And the one who is responsible for narrowing is nicotine. 
So we go to our options and there it is, nicotine, reducing blood supply. So question 34, the symptoms of two diseases are listed. Disease one and disease two. So disease one is coughing up blood, pain when breathing and loss of weight. Disease two is shortness of breath, difficulty breathing out and fatigue. So shortness of breath, difficulty breathing out, this one goes straight to emphysema. So then we're looking at either chronic bronchitis or lung cancer for disease one. So coughing up blood, pain when breathing and loss of weight, these are actually symptoms for lung cancer. So we have the answer of D. Question 35. Which statements about a non-infectious disease may be correct? Non-infectious. So, things like genetic diseases. Okay, so it can result from a mutation, yes. Think of sickle cell. It can be transmitted by an insect vector. Transmitted, no. Non-infectious can't be transmitted by an insect vector. Transmitted from mother to child, well, yes, because here we can transmit genetics, we can inherit diseases. So that one would be a yes. So looking at our options, straight to C, one and three only. As soon as we take out that insect vector, we actually can't have A, B or D. So non-infectious diseases, we are generally focusing then on our genetic diseases.